Hello everybody and welcome to the Alien vs Predator Galaxy podcast, the original Alien and Predator podcast. This is Aaron Percival, aka Corporal Hicks. And this is Adam Zeller, aka Ridgetop. And welcome to Alien Day 2022. Woohoo! Can't wait for it to actually be Alien Day. Because <laughs> we're recording this a little early, so... As always, to give me a chance to get these things ready for release on Alien Day. It's called Preparation, guys and girls. So, yeah, we have no idea what's actually happening today. Uh, but as always, we wanted to do our little bit to contribute towards the festivities today. And that involves finding and bothering somebody of note in the Alien and Predator um, universe. So in the past, we've had the pleasure of speaking to the likes of Carrie Henn, a.k.a. Newt, uh, Ben Rigby, who played Ledward, the original alien victim, as far as timeline's concerned, in the prequels, um, in Alien Covenant. And we also had the opportunity to speak to Mark Verhaden a few years ago, you know, the OG Alien 3, 4, and 5 writer who kicked off the Aliens Expanded Universe. So for this year, we have gone for another mark, actually, another mark. And we went for an author who is responsible for, quite unanimously, one of the favorite alien comics, because it's an interpretation that a lot of fans stuck to until Prometheus came out. And to this day, it is still an interpretation that people are like, you know what? I preferred Destroying Angels. So for this episode, we're talking to Mr. Mark Schultz, most well known for Destroying Angels, I think, among the fandom. But he has quite an illustrious career in alien writing and predator writing, having done quite a few series as, and shorts. Um, so this interview is pre-recorded. This intro has been recorded after the fact. And I have to say it was... Having just finished my first pass on it, really fun and really yeah, enjoyable. We both had a lot of fun with this one. This was a fantastic interview. Um, so we're excited to share it and we hope you enjoy. Indeed. And be sure to let us know what you think afterwards. First of all, Mark, we'd just like to thank you for taking the time to come and talk to some nerds on the internet about Alien and Predator. Uh, before we dive into your work on the franchises, for our listeners and viewers out there who might not know much about yourself, could you tell us a little more about Mark Schultz? Who are you and what do you do? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, I, I, I've, been, I've been a fan of comics and illustration ever since I was a kid and, and movies. And uh, I went to college for fine art, puttered around trying to be a fine artist for several years before finally deciding when I was turning 30 that I better get on with my life and decide what I wanted to do. And I kind of returned to my love of, uh, of comics. And I created a, a series called Xenozoic Tales that was published by Kitchen Sink Press in the States. Uh, and that led to uh, an animated television show that came out of that comic called Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. Uh, and then I kind of trailed off. It became more and more financially difficult to continue this series by the mid nineties. And at that point I jumped into uh, uh, doing work, mostly writing cover work and some writing for uh, other properties, including the Aliens franchise and the, uh, the Predator, Star Wars. I wrote Superman for DC Comics, one of the Superman books for uh, almost five years. And since then I've been working with a small publisher called Flesk out of California that has been publishing collections of my work, republishing Xenozoic, uh, published a new book of mine called Storms at Sea, which was an illustrated novella. And uh, yeah, that that's that's a basic overview. Do you have um, do you have any particular interests yourselves? Like when you're not uh, working? Well, I, I'm I'm interested in the sciences in general and specifically the biological sciences and paleontology. Uh, I've got a good friend who's a, a working paleontologist who um, I've been lucky enough to do some uh, some visual, um, what am I trying to say, um, 
extrapolations of what dinosaur fossils that he's worked with might look like, you know, based on. So basically, I'm serving as his wrist. He's feeding me what his expertise tells him this dinosaur might have looked like while it was living, and I try to execute that. Um, and I, big fan of what I mentioned earlier. I'm a big fan of motion pictures. I'm a big fan of classic comics, and. Uh, and most of my, uh, unfortunately, when you're in the business, most of my time drawing goes to work now. I, I don't n spend nearly as much time just having fun with my, my drawing as I used to, but that, that's okay. It's, it just beats pumping gas for a living. Uh, so, yeah. Cool. So, uh, so along with your writing history, you're, you're also uh, quite an artist yourself, like you did the, the covers of... Um, Apocalypse Destroying Angels as well. well. Quite a few of your Alien and Predator ones as well, wasn't it? For covers? Yeah, they, they asked me to do the covers. Now, I'm, I don't do a lot of interior comic work anymore other than my own because I, I'm, I'm slow. I'm very slow. I can execute covers on a schedule, but not uh, <clears throat> generally not the interior work. So, so I've been lucky enough, yeah, to uh, been uh, included in a number of series that needed cover work. Uh, but yeah, my, my love of drawing and uh, storytelling, written storytelling, kind of collide in comics. I, I like the notion of storytelling in general, whether you're doing it visually or, or in, in, uh, in text. So mm -hmm. it's all, depending on the project, it's all interesting to me. So it was, it was a nice marry of your interests then and, and passions there. Absolutely. Took me a while to figure it out. Like I said, it took me till I was 30 to finally wake up and smell the coffee. But yeah, that was that was it. Coffee um, comics are the are the a nice juxtaposition. I was also interested in filmmaking, but filmmaking is very collaborative by its by necessity. And I like working by myself. So it made more sense to stick with a profession like uh, cartooning. That's fair. That's fair enough. Um, so to go on to the nerdy topics now, though, we <laughs> do have a number of a small number of traditions on the show. And this one in particular is. We always love to hear about the first time our guests ever got to experience the franchises that we're going to be talking about, which in this case is all of them, because you went you, you got to play with Alien and Predator. Mm -hmm. um so and you know do you, and avp yes so do you remember your first encounters with you know our favorite acid-blooded or trophy hunting extraterrestrials absolutely alien was a very important film for me and because of the uh oh uh, the fan press and the uh just the, the, the movie related periodicals of the time, the late seventies, I was very aware that this was in process. There was a lot of good hype. I'm, I'm not sure what the game plan was with 20th Century Fox, but it seems to me in retrospect, there was a lot of information that was being put out in the press about how much of a game changer this would be. And, and with you know some examples of Giger's art and and some of the uh, the the concept work that was being done. So I was primed. I was ready to see this. And I, I saw it the first week of its release. My my uh, wife to be and I went and saw a theater. Uh, you know, just the way you should in a big theater, in in an area that I wasn't uh, that wasn't my home base. So I was even in kind of a. I was neat because it was a outside my comfort zone type of theater and with a full crowd and it was it was about as perfect a movie going experience as you can act ask for uh you know it was one of those films that you don't think about when you're watching it because you're so engrossed it's such a good piece of filmmaking and the audience the people around me were reacting the same way you know you could just see how affected everyone was by you know the the excellence of the of the filmmaking as well as you know the subject matter it it, it didn't matter it was just so it, the subject matter didn't matter as much as the execution now of course I love the subject matter because that's what I'm into 
And, and then the realization came to me, which really, why it was effective for me, was it was the most, one of the most Lovecraftian movies that here was the odd cinematic experience that got beyond, you know, just, just fear of, uh, just fear of having your throat cut or something, or fear of something jumping out in the dark to the, the idea that this is a, a huge universe that really, you know, we're, we're not at the top of the food chain in this universe. And, and the alien in that movie was, he, could, he couldn't be defeated. It was something beyond our understanding or the ability of these people to cope with. And that, that mystery behind all that, that feeling of, uh, of, of something beyond our understanding was real important to me. That's a, that's an important element in, 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 in science fiction and horror that I enjoy. And that was done so well. And you see it so seldom in films uh, that uh, that really made a big impact on me. So long story there, I know, but that's how important that film was to me. And one other thing that I didn't realize at the time, although it did have an impact on me, was the fact that Scott made the hero of the piece a woman, which had since probably the 1940s, Hollywood had gotten away from the idea that the, the person in the crew that was the most level-headed, that kept her crap together and was able to pull out at the end was, was female. And mm -hmm. that was, for my storytelling and my work, that was pretty important to see that. And, and, and that's something throughout all, I think pretty much every single one of your Alien and Predator stories as well. You know, is yep. that female lead. Absolutely. And it's, and it's interesting as well that you zoned, you zoned in on those Lovecraftian elements of Alien, because again, that is a, that is a huge part of why your comic, why Destroying Angels is so well loved because of how much it taps into the Lovecraftian stuff that not a lot of the other series has did. And I'm sure we'll talk about it later on, but, but that you, that you went straight into that is, yeah, it makes a lot of sense knowing what, what, well, what you've got coming up. And I had one advantage in that story and I've, I've been trying to remember the whole process of making that, but if I remember correctly, that series, the Destroying uh, Apocalypse, Destroying Angel, was the first time that Dark Horse had been given permission to use Alien, the concepts in Alien. Before that, it was all Aliens, the second film. Uh -huh. And and so they really hadn't had no one else had had the option of exploring the mythology behind the, the space jockey and uh and where these people came from and the and, and the the uh the questions that were left from the first film um so again and that's what really stays with me about alien much more than as much as i like aliens the cameron film for me it does not have the weight it's not the okay. important classic piece that alien is because of the the scope and the feeling of a lovecraftian universe behind things um so yeah, that was uh, I was given that option to explore that, which I, I don't think had been done before. Okay, and you you explored it really well. Like like I had mentioned in our podcast we did on Apocalypse. Like even though the jockey made an appearance in that original Verheiden Alien series, like when I think of the Space Jockey Alien comic, I think of Apocalypse: The Destroying Angels because that's the one I feel like explored it so well, but still maintained a lot of the mystery with with the Space Jockey. Um, but how about Predator? Do you remember your first time uh, in terms of, of Predator seeing that film? You know what? I missed that when it was in the theater. I didn't see it till it premiered on TV, on television. And uh, yeah, and it was one of those. It's a great film. It's another one of those films that, you know, they took a lot of tropes, but they did it in such a way to make it really engaging. and. Uh, um, John McTiernan. I mean, he's a great he's a great action director. Uh, I it's my favorite Schwarzenegger movie, and uh, yeah, it, it didn't have the impact on me that Alien did, but it's a really good movie. Yeah, 
I'm down. And I think it does have a bit more depth in it than people tend to give it credit for as well. Um, with the way it sort of takes the piss out of things like the A-team and that whole setup and, and the futility of the weapons and stuff like that. Yeah, there's 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 a lot more depth to Predator than I think people yeah. give it credit for. But... And the whole genre switch was just something that was so uncommon, something that started out as like a military you know, testosterone-fueled action movie that quickly pivots into like sci-fi horror. Um, yeah. that was and that was very a... smart that he sets up these guys as super macho and again, because of expectations from previous films, to then have them rather easily disassembled through the uh, course of the movie was good filmmaking, working against expectations. Uh -huh. Definitely. An ongoing debate on our forum is preference over H.R. Giger's original alien design and whether or not you prefer it with the skull visible or not. And we're especially curious to hear the opinions of the creatives who work on the series. So what's your take on the subject? Do you prefer being able to see the the skull and those empty eyes under the alien dome or do you do you just prefer kind of an odd question i know but aaron and i are, are always I saw this this, one. this is one of those little traditions that we always have and it became such a running gag on the forums about being anti or pro skull or whatever that it became a default question for whenever we spoke to anybody with creative talent involved in the um in in the alien series I got to say, I never even considered that before I saw your question. It's, you know, to me, it matters not either way. It's the way it's handled. It's the way it's lit. It's the way it's introduced. It's the way it's used. I don't have any particular preference. The only point where I was not happy with Alien, the way Aliens were presented, it was in, I believe, it was the fourth movie when so much of it was obviously CGI. And they lost their weight. You know, it wasn't good enough CGI for me to say, I, I believe, I can invest and believe these creatures are a threat. It became like, uh, yeah, it just didn't work for me. So other than that, though, I, I've never really, you know, I, I enjoy the different takes on Alien. That's fair. That's fair. Now, this, this is one that we had a lot of variations on of people wanting us to talk to you about it's it's a question everybody was really curious as to your response so in you know in 2010 uh sir ridley returned to the alien franchise with a new prequel series that began with prometheus and then uh, five years later um, continued with covenant and it returned to the space jockeys now for many fans, you know, there, there was, you know, what, another, de there was a decade between the two, mm -hmm. between Prometheus and, and Destroying Angels. And, and for many fans, Destroying Angels was the, the interpretation of the relationship between the aliens and the space jockeys. And the prequels went in a completely opposite direction, uh, moved away from, you know, that particular Lovecraftian way you took that story while also still aping quite a few of the elements you introduced. So everybody wants to know what you thought of those prequel films. Well, first of all, I, I never saw Covenant, so I can't comment on that. But okay. yeah, I mean, there certainly are similarities between Prometheus and uh, Destroying Angels. Um, but you what what or if there's pure coincidence or if someone was reading it um you know you you work on these uh properties and there, there's someone else's toy like i said they get to give you notes on what they want to see and what they don't they didn't give me any notes on destroying angels so i assume there was nothing in there that distressed them at the time. Um, but uh, they own the rights to anything I would have created in there or any concepts. Uh, that's just part of the, the work for hire agreement when you do something like that. Um, so as far as 
them acknowledging that there was any connection, you know, in Hollywood, that's never going to happen. And it, and it could all be coincidence. I, there's no way of really knowing. It seems like there was quite a number of coincidences, but, you know, that's, that's their business and that's their right to handle it however they want to. What did you think of the film, the film from an entertainment perspective, you know, as you sitting there watching it? Did you like the pre, um, Prometheus? It's not a very good movie. I, I think it's, it's kind of a hot mess. Uh, it's, um, and, 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 and let me preface by saying I have absolute respect for Ridley Scott. Um, he's done a number of movies that are at the top of my favorite movies of the last, since the 70s. Uh, he's one contemporary director who knows how to use, I'm not, I'm a much more of a fan of black and white movies than I am of color movies in general, mostly because most directors or even most cinematographers, I guess, they, I, they don't, I don't get the feeling they really know how to use color, but Scott uses color in a very painterly way. So his films are, even if they're not great, they're beautiful to look at. Um, yeah. But I thought they, this film just seemed to introduce too many themes in it that weren't resolved or went nowhere. And um, there was too much trying to satisfy what had been done before in Alien. And it, it was just a mess. Uh, and again, yeah, not every film works out. And uh, you know, a couple of years after that, he does Martian, which I, the Martian, which I think is absolutely brilliant. I, that's pretty close to a flawless movie, but no disagreement um, there. Yeah. I also love really? the Martian. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I, you agree or disagree? I, I miss. Agree. agree. Yeah. We, oh, we, we love the Martian. Really like the Martian. Yeah. I think we were also both pretty disappointed in, in Covenant. I think a hot mess is a good, good description for it. And, and you're right, Scott Scott makes really beautiful looking movies that are very technically impressive from a filmmaking standpoint mm -hmm. and a world building standpoint and production design. Um, but the story was just all over the place in that movie. But um, well, Prometheus just, again, uh, the, 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 you know, they introduce this team of science, but there's, there's hardly any recognizable mythology to the side i mean and i don't expect a lot in a movie but it was uh just yeah and and i got the feeling though again because he introduced a lot of themes that scott likes like the relationship between fathers and progeny and and uh and and where do we come from and all these things uh all these various characters are kind of related to that but I felt that this would have been served better in maybe a, a, a mini series, maybe a six part uh, television series for a, you know, a streaming service or something to be able to develop those themes. Um, it was like trying to jam too much into one, you know, two hour, two hour and 20 minute movie, whatever it was. Scott likes to have these grand ideas and, and grand concepts to explore, but he's, He's still very much also a businessman who has to keep yeah. his cuts down to two hours to please the studios. To yeah, is is in a weird is in a weird position. I think in in that, that regards, and that that allows him to continue to make these incredibly sure. expensive movies. And uh, and some and sometimes, like again, The Martian, man, it works to perfection. He, you know, he's got one problem to solve, one central great two-hour movie i think yeah, it helps martian. as well but sorry go ahead adam i was just gonna say the martian is uh what got me really uh excited for his sequel to prometheus alien covenant because i was like oh mm -hmm. he's he's got it back now now it's gonna be good and i think aaron and i are a bit more split on alien covenant i think i was more disappointed than he was um but i still recommend it i mean there's there's some interesting coincidences in that one too with mm -hmm. uh with apocalypse um, so it's at least worth a watch, I would say. You know, one thing that I really did like, I like the the end of uh, of uh, Prometheus, where oh, what's her name? Naomi Rapides, yeah, goes off theoretically to find 
the home world of the, uh, the engineers. And I thought, uh -huh. wow, here we go. Let's see, you know, and then and again, I didn't see Covenant, but what I understand is that really doesn't go any place. Yeah, not not really resolved in Covenant. <laughs> we, yeah. we all wanted your necropolis. Um, we we got we got ancient Rome. So oh really? Yeah. Still still some interesting oh. aspects about it, but yeah, the the necropolis idea, the the lone scientist at the necropolis, very much reminded me of uh, of Apocalypse. Interesting. Well, I, I assume I'll at some point I'll pull that up and watch it, but. Uh, yeah, it, it's got its flaws. It's got its flaws, but I I still really enjoy it. Something do you, do you was... have any idea if 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 Scott is going to do a, a a trilogy? Is he going to have a third? That that was the plan, but I don't think Covenant did as well as as they were hoping. Um, okay. I know he's executive producing both the TV series and there was a new movie that just that was just announced by. Uh, I guess Fede Alvarez is doing it, but that's going to be Fede Alvarez's take that's not really connected to any of the other films. Um, but I mean, the prequels have their fans. Like there's a, a good good portion of the fans that do really like the prequels. And and I do feel bad because the second movie, just like Prometheus, ends on a cliffhanger. And uh -huh. there's there's just like Prometheus, there's unresolved threads there that, you know, it would... It, wouldn't be great if they were forever unresolved, or maybe it would be, Aaron. I know you want them to remain unresolved, <laughs> yes. but it can stay. And, and that's, the, that's almost a danger when when one of these genre films becomes popular enough to become a franchise. There's the incentive for the studio is to keep stringing it out uh, as long as possible to you know make money. You don't want to resolve things totally, and. Uh, and 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 it's always diminishing results, uh, yeah. in my opinion. Not not always probably, but it's hard. It's hard to make something that has the impact and the quality as it, as it goes along. It, it the the returns are less and less. The, yeah. the creative returns are less and less. Well, even in your story, you you do it well. Like you you resolve the story, but you also kind of allude to events that could happen. Uh, and where the characters are going. So it feels like a contained story uh, that's mostly resolved, but you also leave room for the next story uh, in Apocalypse. Which, which there was never any discussion about continuing with those characters or with the concepts. And I don't know if that just had to do with... Uh, uh, the series didn't do well enough for Dark Horse to want to continue with it, or if there was ever any. I, I'm not quite sure why the Apocalypse name was stuck on this. I, I wanted to just call it Aliens Destroying Angels, and somewhere along the line, Dark Horse decided Alien Apocalypse was going to be the overriding title, but it never went any place after that. Uh, Is it, that that's 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 interesting because. The way Mike uh, Hansen, you know, your editor on Destroying Angels, spoke Mike, in, you know, the... Mike Hansen, Mike Hansen wasn't... Phil Amara was my editor. Okay. I want to see if Mike Hansen was... Uh, I don't see him in any of the credits okay. here. Maybe, maybe he was... Chris, Chris Warner was the series editor. Now, uh, now you've got me questioning here. Hang on. I'm sure it was. It was in the back of the. Um, it was in the the letter sections, basically. Well, oh, maybe it wasn't there. Well, maybe he it was just the right guy. Supervised by contact with him. Okay. Well, it was just some of the, the some of the things he said in the the comic in the letter sections. You know, made it very much sound like it was going to be the first in a series. Might which, have been. Um, but to, to be fair, though. The next comic, pretty not yours. The next series after, pretty much killed <laughs> uh, Alien and and versus and Predator mm. for nearly a decade. Yeah, no, oh, that was Xenogenesis. Yeah. Okay. Again, I'm not familiar with much of the work that was done beyond what I yeah. contributed to, so I have That's no fair. opinion. 
Okay. Uh, let's talk a little about how you came to work with Dark Horse on Alien and Predator. I believe your first story for them was Predator Hell and Hot Water. Uh, so how did you come to be involved with that series? I got a call from the editor, Bob Cooper. Uh, and uh, I, I have no, I, no remembrance of what the uh, connection was. If he talked to someone that I, we had in common that, that recommended me or suggested that I was looking for work. But it came at a good time when I was looking for work. Uh, but it was kind of out of the blue, as I remember. I, I don't specifically remember any anything other than would you be interested in writing a, a Predator series? And you also did a, a Dark Horse Presents around that same time, something different, something original, didn't you? Was that before or after? Um, oh, boy. I don't remember. Oh, fair enough. Uh, it, it might have been it might have been before might have been about the same time you know what that might have been the connection i did write a story for al williamson uh who is one of the uh you know one of the the old masters of comics who was still working at the time and he was a good friend of mine and i wrote him a short story that appeared in dark horse presents and that that could have been the connection that led to the uh okay. the predator i'm not sure but that might have been it so was that was that your pitch then? Uh, did they come to you and say, "Have you got any stories you want to do?" Or did they come to you with the concept and will you do this for Helen Hot Water? Well, no, it was my pitch. I uh, I had learned to scuba dive recently, and uh, okay. I really was interested in incorporating that into a story. And I wanted, if I remember correctly, I wanted to do something in an environment. That was the, the predator hadn't been put in up to that point, you know, just to say, you know, he, he's these guys are the ultimate hunters and they're interested in, you know, all sorts of different challenges. And uh, yeah. And that kind of leads into our next question um, that the majority of your work in the alien predator franchises are unique, often for both narrative and artistic reasons. And your very first piece that we're talking about, Hell in Hot Water, is no different. It's the only Predator story we can think of that is set underwater. Um, what challenges did the setting present when developing the story, if any? Uh, boy, again, specific, specifically, I don't remember that there was any big problems. It was, uh, again, I was eager to use what I had learned about scuba diving and 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 of course the technology i was giving the uh the team that went underwater in this story it was far in advance of what i used as a you know run-of-the-mill diver i had them using rebreathers and, and military grade equipment um so that was just fun research to do and uh and and my other interest at the time it's still an interest is in uh just uh what do they call extreme extremophile life forms yeah. forms microscopic mostly forms that live in you know either sunless environments where they're living on chemical energy or just living in environments that we would consider in, uninhabitable and 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 they that became the creatures in in, in the story that uh that the predator was hunting along with 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 man uh you call them um, the tardigrades, I think. Right? Yeah, well, tardigrades are a, a, a microscopic creature, water bears. If you saw the uh, the Ant Man movies, uh, when they go down to the quantum zone, they're going past these creatures that are menacing the uh, the little ship they're shrinking in, and those are those are tardigrades. Mm -hmm. They're actual. And, they're and actual that? creatures. It's yeah. the one thing is just to make them giant, you know, and then they become menacing. And it is most, they are mostly found underwater, aren't they? You know, volcanic places and stuff like that. Is that yeah, right? Well, not totally very specifically, but, but that was what I was getting at, that these, these are creatures that were adapted to this incredibly harsh environment. And, and tardigrades, actually, they're amazing. They... They can they can stay in a state of suspended animation essentially for for I believe centuries, 
before you know you reconstitute them with a little water. Um, so yeah, they're, they're tough little critters. And make perfect prey. Yeah, perfect prey and perfect predators too. If you're smaller than them. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I've always personally felt that the expanded universe never really capitalized on was something introduced in Predator 2, and that's this other world life forms organiz um, organization. So there's comics such as Bad Blood or your own Helen Hot Water that would use non-named government organizations instead. And I always felt like that was a missed opportunity to have this sort of overarching mythology around, you know, the OWLF. So I was, I was curious as to if there was ever any consideration into including OWLF in the comic and expand on that mythology, or was that just a, you know, roll, roll with what I'm doing kind of thing? Yeah, I'm afraid it's more the latter. Um, it makes perfect sense what you're saying. I agree. And I'm not quite sure why there wasn't like a, uh, an editorial voice there or notes that would suggest maybe we want to exploit this concept we already began in the movie, mm -hmm. in the second movie. Um, that's a good question. I don't have an answer for that, but it, it makes perfect sense. I don't know why. Uh, the second movie wasn't, again, I didn't think was a very good movie, <laughs> but, uh, and I'm not sure. I'm trying to remember if I would have seen that I'm sure I had seen it before I wrote the series. Okay. Uh, but I guess it didn't stick out in your mind then, uh, that particular no, element? No, apparently not. Apparently not. And and that would have been the type of thing. It makes, again, it makes perfect sense. I'm just wondering now, why didn't I talk with uh, my editor and say, hey, is this something we should go with, give a name to these people, instead of just keeping them a shadowy, nebulous organization? Uh -huh. Well, I suppose I it's like you were saying as well. I can't remember if it was off the air or, or when we started recording, but you know uh, the notations from Fox and stuff. Um, I guess if they weren't picking it up, you know, in your submissions either, then yeah, it's it's not being no. picked up. And and uh, again, very hands off at the time. I I don't think they saw the potential in like Predator as a becoming a franchise type of deal where they were concerned with making sure, you know, they, they could maximize the potential by keeping everything in, in line. Oh. And uh, again, I have no idea even if anyone at Fox actually read the synopses, you know, the, the, the proposals, there was never any, uh, there was never any suggestions or, or negative comments. Oh, okay. Oh. I just, it kind of makes me glad that particular element's now being picked up and, and that a little bit more care is, is going off there. But yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah. So after Helen Hot Water, you went on to do Aliens Havoc. I think it was a two issue run. Um, Havoc is especially interesting. <laughs> That's a in... nice way of putting it. <laughs> And I, and I don't say that as like some diplomatic cover of anything. <laughs> I think it is a genuinely interesting story in the way that the perspective shifts nearly, um, nearly every page to start with, and then near enough multiple panels within the same page later. And while I imagine it was especially challenging on the editorial side of things, how was that like to work on? I mean, did, did that visual consideration even cause a blip on your radar, you know, as, as you were writing it? What what was that comic like? And, and where the hell did that concept come from? It was given to me. That was one time I was giving a, uh, given a, an editorial concept that I had to work within that structure. They wanted a story where... Um, the, the gimmick was every page would be done by a different artist. And that was what I was given. So I, and that was fine. I could have just read, written a story, any type of story and okay, every page will be done by a different artist. But I, I decided for, for better or worse to let's integrate that different 
look on every page into the story by uh, but by having the uh, the pers the, um, the the perspective changed between uh, every page was a different character, and therefore the look would change based on who the character was. Um, and it all and and the difficult thing was it all had to be told to make that work. The perspective had to be the perspective of the individual on that page. So it was always what was what the reader was seeing in the panels was what that character was seeing. And the problem with that was some of the artists, most of the artists got the concept or, or at least they honored the concept and they stayed with that. They presented their, their work, their drawings, panel by panel drawing echoed the, the viewpoint of the, uh, the perspective, the point of view of the, per, uh -huh. of the person in that page. Some, however, didn't. Whether they didn't get it or just didn't care, they drew whatever they wanted. And, and so oh. that... I, th I think, I think, um, didn't John Gerard uh, Morbius do a, um, a panel that is just entirely incomprehensible? I have no idea what's going off in, in that singular I don't panel. Remember. I honestly don't remember everyone that was, uh, was involved with that project because what was it? It was 40 different artists. Maybe I don't know a lot. Adam um, shared the, um, we were talking earlier and he, and he shared the credits page on, on the digital version of it. And he was like, damn, there's so many yeah. artists on this. It was, yeah, it was insane. You know, it was a high concept piece and it was like a tightrope act and we didn't make it across the tightrope, I feel. It was, it was a worthy concept, but it was probably asking too much to wrangle all those artists into following yeah, that your that concept all the way through there's a lot of there's a lot of great art in there and it's fun because it's different uh but i'm i'm not i haven't looked at that honestly in probably two decades so it's hard for me to even comment on <laughs> if it worked or not at all or if it was just a again a hot mess that didn't come together i, I always quite, enjoyed it yeah. yeah i quite enjoyed it i i think it was the first time i had ever read it actually uh in prep for this podcast and uh it was just so cool seeing a different artist take from each page now it kind of works you into that like you start with a single art style at first and then it's okay. page after page after page is is a different artist in a different art style and uh you know in some of the other comics i always think it's interesting seeing uh, callbacks to previous scenes, but done in a different art style. But with this one, we get to see that every page. We're seeing the same environments, the same characters, the same events happening, but but totally different art style. And and I thought it made for it made for a really unique um, and compelling, honestly, comic reading experience. It also has one of my favorite settings in comics, which is like the space luxury liner. Because um, I think that's just such a cool location for an alien outbreak. And I don't think we'd see that again until a more recent AVP comic, which was called um, Thicker Than Blood. Blood. Yeah, which also was on a space uh, mm. luxury cruiser. Um, so the location, I thought, was also really cool. Yeah, I'm trying to remember why I chose that, other than it gets a lot of opportunities. I think I might have been thinking Poseidon Adventure with all the interesting interiors different set pieces you could use uh for particular oh, yeah. scenes but, like the engine room and your giant um mm -hmm. observation dome and stuff like that yeah right right but i should i should i i would have i would have reacquainted myself with that but i can't find where my copies are so i haven't looked at it in a long time um Oh. But it was it was a fun experiment. It was a fun experiment, and I I can't imagine how difficult it was for the editor to deal with trying to wrangle all those I artists and putting the work in. <laughs> no. And if I remember rightly, I mean, we normally have a question about this, but I seem to have missed it in in yours. Um, and we generally always ask about your familiar familiar. Oh my god. How familiar you were with um, previous stories um, leading up to what you were working in, and if I remember rightly, with this one, you know, you did go 
you did go into previous elements because I think it was framed around the royal jelly. Is that right, Adam? Yeah, the, they the, mentioned yeah. Zeno Zip in it. Yeah. So, well, I'll ask you now since I've completely missed it. But you know, um, before you did, or I guess while you were working on the comics as well, had you had you really dipped into the other series? As were you conscious of calling back to no, previous much. runs? They might have fed me some uh, previous work that they wanted to incorporate into Havoc, uh, and I would have read that. But, you know, other than that initial series that Mark Vander Heiden wrote, um, I really hadn't kept up with what had been what was being produced by Dark Horse. So, no, uh -huh. I, I didn't have a lot of backstory there. But they very well may have sent me uh, previous um stories that they wanted me to jump off of or incorporate in some manner i'm not sure okay, okay. Yeah. in havoc is all is uh also where you introduce the name and i'm going to try and pronounce this correctly uh lingua foda acaronsis uh yeah. a, a binomial name for the aliens that well could only use in the expanded universe um would get used a lot on message boards and mail groups could you tell us about your decision to coin a binomial name for the alien instead of sticking with the conventional xenomorph? Well, I, I, I just figured, again, my interest in science and biology, I just figured that this was a life form that scientists would have, if any scientists who were aware of it, whoever was describing the creature first, the scientist who had the honor of describing the xenomorph would have given it a scientific name or a um the latin version which is the accepted version in all languages eh? so if you're a chinese scientist you know what the english scientist is talking about when they say lingua foda acarensis it's the same across language barriers that's that's just standard that was linnaeus i think he was swedish back in the 17 or 1600s came up with that system and that's what we that's what science still uses. Uh, so I, I just figured that it, I asked the editor, and I'm trying to remember who the editor was. I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember. But I asked if there had been a scientific name, a, a Latinized science accepted name for the creature. And there hadn't been. So I said, well, is it OK? Do you mind if I come up with one? And they said, no, go ahead. And again, it was submitted to Fox, and they apparently didn't have a problem with it. So, it, it, to me, it just needed it just needed that. Now, it's not something that right your average person is going to be calling the creature, but I don't know. I just like that little detail. I like that little bit of uh, uh, rounding out the, the uh, yeah. our understanding you, you are, of the creature. You are one of only two people to do that. Yeah, yeah, the next one was Internectivus Raptus, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. okay. And what was that done for? Uh, the Blu-ray. No, not the Blu-ray. The DVD. The The producer of the DVD, a absolutely wonderful gem of a man that does not get enough love, um, called Charles de Lozarica. Um, He snuck it in the menus of, um, oh. of the, the, the DVD box set. Um, the DVD of, of Alien? The, the uh, first movie or well the the series um oh the one series four. yeah the collection yeah. okay yeah okay um, so that 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 one you 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 used yours pretty much exclusively nobody else did and the internecevus thing has only been Side used show. a sideshow of... sideshow Side yeah it, it's been used pretty okay. much on just some statues so All right. yeah you 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 were you were rather unique there and it was it was always one I always enjoyed. I did a little article um, a good few years ago on the various names that the aliens went by, and I enjoyed diving through stuff to uh, to to look at those. It was a good idea because xenomorph in the second film, you know, this is a very overly broad term just used by the military in that movie, and you would think that right. scientists, yeah, would want to be more specific about it. To be more specific, and but at the same time, I mean the. Uh... The actual contact with the creatures to be able to study their actual physical presence i don't know you know i don't know 
does that ever, is that ever encountered? Well, it was in the fourth movie. Yeah, they had, right. Um, actual scientists did so. Um, I, I get I get the time frame of these things, the, the chronology all screwed up. So I have no idea where Havoc would have fallen within the, the chronology of the films. <laughs> I think you were. I think you were after Resurrection. I think everything you did was after Resurrection. Really? Mm-mm. I think so because Resurrection right. was ninety seven, ninety eight, and I'm, right. I'm fairly, I'm fairly sure you were working with Dark Horse from ninety eight. Right, but but oh, I, I mean within the chronology of the storytelling of the. Uh, oh, of the, okay. The, yeah, you know, probably that big gap between three and Resurrection. Yeah, mo- most most, most of, of Dark Horse yeah. is is between three and four. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, for many fans out there it's your work on aliens apocalypse the destroying angels that stands out above most of the other alien stories out there how did you come to be involved in that series again uh the editor phil amara who i had worked with when he was an editor at kitchen sink press he had been my editor for a while on uh on xenozoic tales he had moved out west and worked was working with dark horse and I, again, just got a call and the offer for a job. Was was that a, do you want to pitch us something again? Or was that, we want to do something along this line? Well, again, I think it was, it was my pitch. And I think it was, again, it was predicated. I was really happy when they said, they indicated that I could use the, this, this conceptual m- conceptual material from from the first movie alien which hadn't been av- av- available to to be integrated before then at least not for me um but it was at that point and they they allowed me to get back to as we talked earlier you know my my primary love of alien the the lovecraftian elements the idea that it's a it's a big unknowable universe and we're just uh just a small, uh, relatively unimportant part of that. So that okay. that's what was really intriguing, and that really got my uh, got my juices flowing. That was a yeah. Okay. So un- unlike most typical alien stories, you know, destroying angels, it didn't feature competing corporations, but instead you had this organization called, um, well, I'll probably butcher this as well, uh, G-Hole God. And the name that always made me think of Behold God, um, hmm. which was more of a science collective than anything else. Um, was this a deliberate step away from, you know, those alien tropes of evil corporations? First yeah. of all, did he get it right? Is it G-Hole God or is it Gehole God? I, I, I'm not sure. I, I have a feeling that it's probably the guttural Dutch hole God, <laughs> which I can't do correctly. But I'll, I'll tell you, this is interesting. You had, you had written the question asking about the, the corporation. I've always called it hole God, but I have no idea if that's correct. And I, again, trying to remember what I was thinking 20 some years ago, I thought I had been looking for a name and had found that online. And I went searching for it. I did a Google search for it. Nothing except its usage in destroying angels. So I will, and I, you know, I kept going and going and absolutely nothing on the Gehol God. The closest thing I could find to it was I think it's Geholian or Jeholian, which is a I believe it was Frisian or some some middle Germanic language that means to 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 have something to to acquire to own something I believe and I'm wondering now well did I see that and extrapolated somehow get forgot out of that I it's weird I do not know where I got the name all I know is it didn't I didn't come up with that whole cloth there was some there was some information I got online that led to that happening, but for the life of me, I, I, it's lost. It's lost to me. Well, even that seems thematic as to what you were doing with the organization. You know, they were collecting science for 
you right. know, dissemination and, and yeah. And, and as near as I can tell, that was probably, that may very well have been why I went with that because I liked that it, it related to acquiring something. Yeah. But but what about leaning away from like Wayland Utani or Bionational or Grant or any of the other ones and going for this science collective, you know, was there any particular reason in there? I like the idea of, of an organization that at least was pretending was after pure knowledge. Uh, and this probably guess... goes back to, again, the films and, 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 and entertainment stuff I, I read or saw as a kid and having these uh, science-based organizations that were kind of shadowy and in the background. Uh, one of the most important in, uh, inspirational things as a kid that uh, TV, it was a television series called The Outer Limits in the in the early 60s. The black which and had white a, great, one. Uh, a great episode called The Architects of Fear. And and the uh, the the instigating force in, in that particular uh, episode, the self-contained story, was this shadowy group of uh, scientists who were uh, they were well, I won't get into it, it, it but but it was it was fascinating to me that that you would have these uh, different uh, people who were supposedly uh, directed by intellect and, and wanting the best, but it still gets corrupted in the end if things aren't handled right. And yeah. so that's kind of was the incentive, I guess, for the whole God and, and Tellurian and, uh, and Keitel just uh, that all the best intentions of the world can go or can go awry if, if not uh, if people's intent isn't isn't good or they feel they know better than someone else as a really interesting concept um, and yeah the the whole evil corporation theme and alien does get repeated a lot and and you do have Waylon Yutani featured in the story it's just more of a background role um, but yeah, this this science collective that was still kind of a shadowy, shadowy group, and um, there was also like an element of religiosity to them, I guess, like just in their the structures that they had and their their clothing that they wore. It seemed like it was kind of a religion of science almost. Or so that's kind of how I took it. Um, I know you said um, outer limits, but but I was curious: were there any other inspirations for the group, or was it mainly mainly from the outer limits? Well, I'm sure I'm, I'm trying to think there were other, uh, you know, classic science fiction works that I'd read as a kid that feature that type of a uh, institution. Uh, I, I offhand, I'm not recalling anything in particular other than uh, Fritz Leiber's Gather Darkness, which is a great uh, story about a, a, not, a futuristic autocracy, you know, a, that is challenged by a uh, an organization of uh, again shadowy scientists who masquerade as a religion in order to infiltrate and 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 get their objections or their their objectives uh, um, i'm sure there's others it's it's a trope you know it's been used many times um, but but i would think that that hour limits episode was probably the, the primary inspiration for how i handled them i'm also tickled by the fact that it was called uh, what did you say the architects of fear fear because the the episode name i plan for this this particular episode is is the architect of the apocalypse oh okay <laughs> better not the engineer of the apocalypse the, no the architect. <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah that tickles me okay so I, I'm not sure you're going to be able to go into this too much, mostly because I think you've talked about it a little bit, really, as we've been going along. But when you were working on Destroying Angels, you know, one of the prevalent fan theories about the relationship between the aliens and the space jockey was that the aliens were their creation. You know, they were a tool of the space jockeys. Apocalypse goes a completely different direction with it, you know, making them making the jockeys a victim of the alien which i guess is more in line with alien rather than the fan theory that it had spun into but 
um you know could you tell us a little bit about you know that that story direction and and going that angle well again that's pure um lovecraftian you know a big universe of which we are a uh just a component you know it, it gets away from the whole religion especially you know judeo-christian religion that we are the chosen people the center of the universe you know we are god's chosen neat thing about lovecraft was he threw that all out and said you know no the real story is we're no more important than anything else and there's there's bigger forces out there than us um which, which, which is again for me is where both an enormous feeling of awe comes from as well as a feeling of you know potential horror uh -huh. uh, but I think that's funny as well because that's the completely opposite direction that Ridley Scott goes yeah, with the that's prequels. What was, mm -hmm. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, I mean, even the the aspect of um, the space jockeys in your story being like billions of years old, this long dead civilization, uh, as opposed to the alien prequels where they are still an active civilization and we're really just seeing uh, an installation of theirs where there was an outbreak. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I do think it, it definitely is more of a Lovecraftian vibe having them as this, this ancient race, ancient long gone race. My other interest in, in going in that direction was, and this is the predominant theme in, in my Xenozoic stories is, is the ecological angle that there's gotta be a balance between everything in, in, a, in a system in a natural system for it to work. Uh, so the idea that, uh, which may or may not be true because the man who's proposing this, Keitel, is crazy. You know, he's, he, he's, he's, gone, he's gone over the edge. But his belief that they are a, like a universal plague that's going to sweep across and, 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 and that responds to civilizations to get us to a certain point of technolo technological abilities. Be they become spacefaring races and are a threat to the, again, this theoretical ecological balance throughout planetary systems. Um, and again, I, I try to keep it, I kind of keep it vague whether or not this is true or if it's just the, uh, the ravings of a madman. I really uh, like the quote from what your protagonist Throop said, where she goes, uh, he may be crazy, but I suspect he's at least half right or something like that. Yeah. You want to give the readers a little bit of fear there, you know, <laughs> that is, you know, just that there, there might be something here. He, he, I found him very self-aware as well though, which makes me lean to the, not lying, not crazy kind of um, take on it, okay. but like your your take, your take is really the take as far as a lot of people are concerned. Um, Prometheus, screw it, kind of thing. You know, you, it was the perfect blending of, of Alien and and Lovecraft and expanding on what was in Alien. So there are you'll you'll often see many many people comment. You know, when when Destroying Angels comes up. This is what Prometheus should have been. This is the way it should have gone. And uh, there'll be many more behind them going, yep, agree. Uh, myself well, included. So, uh, yeah, well, I, I very, think you nailed it right. It's very kind. It's, uh, it, again, it's not, uh, it, what's the, what's the word? It's, uh, I can't think of the word, but it's, whatever's in the films is, is and is owned by 20th Century Fox Disney is is Bible. It's the oh, canon. You're talking about canon, on you? Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Everything else is just people riffing on it, and to be disposed of or used as they choose. Um, uh, I did want to say though, just you're making me think of things here too. As far as the Kaitel character, you were asking about influences on the Gehol God. But Kaitel, my use of Kaitel is absolutely uh, is is Kurtz from Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, the which I've used any number of times in stories. The uh, 
the brilliant man who acquires so much power, you know, and the idea that absolute power corrupts absolutely, that he he uh-huh. just does horrible things because he he can. His his uh his belief in the the ends justify the means goes out of control. So that that's that was another major element in in my development of that story of you know my fondness for Heart of Darkness. And well, that's another you... tap. You go ahead, Aaron. And that's another tapping into you know long running alien influences as well. There, Joseph Conrad. Yeah. Well, Again, the Nostromo, of course, you know, uh, from the first movie is a, is a, mm. is a, uh, all the ship names is a Conrad, Conrad, uh, yeah. Narcissus, Sulaco, a, a lot of the expanded universe does it as well. Um, goes down yeah. those routes. Mm-hmm. And certainly if they, and, and, and I also read the story, I realized I named the, uh, the ship that goes after the rescue ship, the Rachel. Which is the res- the ship that rescues uh, Ishmael in Moby Dick? That's oh. where that came from. That was deliberate. That was deliberate. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Didn't know that one. Wouldn't have guessed that one. <laughs> I mean, it, it's hard to argue that the ends justify the means. If if he was correct about the aliens being a galactic um, extermination species, I guess. Yeah. Um, I don't. Yeah, know what, I, was... I don't know what the. What would the human race do about it, though? I mean, unless they said, "Okay, we're going to retreat entirely well, from faith-bearing," and uh... well, I think Kirsch at the end was saying um, we have to find a way to uh, like coexist. join with them, yeah, coexist, and that's what he was trying to do with the vaccine, where the aliens wouldn't wouldn't attack humans, um, and it, that was also a really interesting concept to me, like he considered his research incomplete. So how much further would that have gone? What exactly did he mean by coexist with, with the alien? Um, yeah. So it raises I don't know if the human, Yeah, I don't know if the human race, I think, you know, my remembrance is he wanted to create some sort of a genetic hybrid between humans and aliens. Um, I guess I didn't make that clear in the story um, but yeah, would the human race want to do that? Would be the question. Some if it meant their survival. Yeah. yeah, they made it. Yeah, some who did might have survived. Yeah, interesting. Because that kind, of, I think that kind of plays into the transhumanism elements that the franchise is starting to toy with now. Really, right? And and that was an element too. If I'm not in in, in Alien Four, right? The yeah, idea yeah, I, of. Uh, yeah, I suppose to some degree with um, Ripley, isn't it? Yeah, genetic mm-hmm. memory. So here, here's a minutia question that's going to be a very simple yes or no. I think um, there's a particular thing in Destroying Angels, uh, this descending uh, descending staircase going down to the necropolis, mm-hmm. and it, it reminds me of a not very well known, unused concept from Alien. You know this this what they call the red city. Um, it's not very well known about. There's bits of concept art, scene snippets of script, uh, but that reminded me very much of what we knew of of the red city. Was that intentional on your part, or was that just um, coincidence? No, I, I'm. I don't have any recall of seeing. You're saying this was concept art for a scene that wasn't used. Yeah, there's in... some there were some storyboards of of it, yes. Okay. Huh. But it's not I, I very, it's not very well it. known. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, that's a good question. And and I'm not sure how much um how much art direction I gave to Doug Wheatley for something like that. I I, I just believe I said it was a, a big you know, a stamp going down. But I, yeah, I'm not sure where he made it. He's someone you might talk to at some point. He might have, he brought a lot of the visual, of course, to that. I wrote it, but, you know, his, the, the, the visual elements are, you know, pretty much all his. All right. Yeah. Fair enough. I thought that would be a very, uh, a very simple question. 
So Red City was from. No, I'm very intrigued. I'm very intrigued by this uh, these storyboards you're talking about. I I'll I'll dig them out. Them. I'll dig them out and send okay, them to you. I'm you. fairly sure I've got them on my um my library, right. as I like to call it. From the original film, right, Aaron? Yeah, so it, it was Alien. It was I'm trying to think of the which, timeline which here. Means I may I very well may have seen it because I was obsessed when that film came out with collecting whatever I could find. You know, in pre-online days, of course, but there were a number of, of books and uh, articles published about the concept work behind Alien, because especially Giger's stuff, but uh, but Ron Cobb's work and mm -hmm. Mobius's input. So I'd be very interested. I may have seen it, but I don't remember it. I don't think it was in any of the making of books because, uh, it's like I said, it's it's quite a rare, random piece of of the development. And while Adam asks the questions, I'm going to try and find it because I, I can't remember the artist's name as well. I'm surprised it wouldn't it wouldn't be in Rinsler's book. It, it's mentioned huh. in Rinsler's book. Uh, Destroying Angels is notable for being one of only a handful of appearances of an alien slash space jockey hybrid. Design-wise, it's actually very subdued with only the large size and small nub to indicate the trunk. Uh, we're curious mm -hmm. as to the creative decisions that took you down that route. Did you have um, input, I guess, in the style of that, or was that just the the artist's take? That was all the artist. I, I don't think I gave him any directions other than it had to be huge. It had to be in keeping with the size of the uh, the, uh, the the jockey, the uh, the the uh, the, uh, the the species, the giant from which it hatched. Uh, um, but other than that, that was all Doug Wheatley's design. And yeah, I I just got to say, Aaron, I think both of us love the artwork um, in in Apocalypse. Like Wheatley's Wheatley's artwork for that was was really solid. Doug was. Um, yeah, he did a, a fantastic job. Again, I, I can't imagine the amount of hours he put into realizing the detail and the, and the lighting effects he put into that. But uh, yeah, it's a magnificent achievement. And the coloring was perfect for it, too, I thought. It was uh, ju just a gorgeous, very unique looking book. And he would actually come back and do that um, AVP comic, the more recent one that I mentioned earlier, uh, Thicker Than Blood, oh. um, which I think was his his uh, the only comic where he did the interiors other than Apocalypse was Thicker Than Blood because he did a few other covers. Right. Um, he did covers for Life and Death and of Iron Stones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'll, I'll look for that then because I love his work. I uh, Again, I haven't... I haven't been in a comic shop in a long time, so I haven't uh, kept up with. Was was that series the Thicker Than Blood? Was that within the last few years? Or it was know? Dark Horse's last Alien versus Predator title. Okay, okay. Before very it good over to Marvel. Yeah, yeah I very good I think comic. It's one of our favorite AVP comics, Aaron. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. good. And I, that. I've sent you that storyboard I found. Um, it's Elliot Scott Thanks. is the artist's name. Um, not okay. quite, a, not quite a spiral thing, but it's the ancient city um, okay. kind of um, okay. element to it. Yeah, and and this would have been a scene on the on the planet on the moon when they yes. were yeah the, somehow it, under the spaceship or something or uh, yeah, it was one of the explorations for where they'd find the aliens and stuff like that. The script that okay. particular draft isn't out there, but this artwork is. And the snippets mm -hmm. of it in Rinsler's book, like um, Adam was talking about. Cool. Well, something to look forward to. Great. When we revisited the comic for our recent review episode, uh, it was pointed out that the method of travel that the ship employs was very similar to the then recent film Event Horizon. Was that an intentional inspiration? You know what? Honestly, I've never seen Horizon. I, I, need, I want to and I need to, but. I, I I understand though I know what I know what the concept is. Uh, it was more it was more the 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 idea of particle drive and bending space comes more from Dune, actually. Oh yeah, the um, spice the guild, or the spacing guild. Yeah, with those right, big ships. Right. 
So I was using terms like bending space that come straight from the novel Dune. And I, and I believe it was in the Lynch film too. Um, so that's where that came from. And, and that is actually uh, a contrivance that I put in there that I'm kind of, uh, it, it's so much not a part of the rest of the alien universe. I needed something, I felt I needed something to get them there in a timely fashion rather than the years that would take them to get there under con the conventional methods that would have interfered with other stories and timelines. I needed something to get them there quickly because this is early on. This is, you know, relatively soon after the first movie in, in chronological terms oh. within yeah, the concept. It's so one I of came very up few and you know, between. No one, Right. No one objected to it. And I was kind of surprised if I remember because it was outside. But again, it, it's it's um, it's a contrivance that I wish there had been another way around. But I, I couldn't figure out a way to make the story work without having that in there, getting them there quickly, instantaneously. So mo moving on from Destroying Angels but keeping within the um that sort of setting that you were playing with you know you would write a short called uh, once in a lifetime um another one of those things where it was kind of like oh is this going to be a serious thing because there was something in there called the mandela directive that you you drop but then never gets never gets done anywhere else so that was one of those is this mark doing something intentional for a sequel here but no um it this question's more about the planet, um, the name of the planet, um, which is Tiago Myra's a planet that had previously been the setting in another alien story called Wraith, uh, one shot by Jay Stevens from the year before. Was that intentional or was that just a, a random pluck? Well, here's, here, here's the story behind that. I didn't even remember I was involved with that story till you brought it up. <laughs> and I think it was, in, that was a story, the story itself, the plot was brought to me by Phil Amara, my co-author. I helped with some dialogue. I didn't have much to do with the concept or, or the, the action or the references are all from Phil. All right. I, I don't even remember Rick Leonardi did nice art on it. I remember that, but I don't remember anything about the story in Fair particular. Enough. So no, no memory of the Mandela directive either then. No, I, and, and I was, again, I, I know I have a copy of it someplace, but I can't find it, you know, it's buried under a ton of other material someplace. Okay. A bit of a mini Sorry. sequel set up to, um, Apocalypse. Or it's a sequel? Yeah, oh. it's a sequel. I had thought it was a prequel. Mm. Interesting. I, I got to go back and look at it. But again, it was Phil was my editor on the uh, on uh, the uh, Destroying Angels. So, you know, he would have been very involved with developing that story. So he, you know, I, I can't remember the circumstances, but he obviously he took something from that and developed it into this, this follow up story. <clears throat> But he brought me on board to help with some elements and to help with the dialogue. But, but that was about it. I didn't have a lot of involvement with it. Okay. Adam. Sorry, um, I was just checking something. Are we sure it's not a prequel? Because he still has the owl in Obviously. that one. Yeah, but the owl came back. Oh, I thought she had gone off to to do something oh. else. That she didn't go back to that group. Oh, the, the, the owl. Wow, the owl appears in that story. Yeah. Wow, it, I have. It, you'd think I'd remember that. It's it's definitely a sequel because they're talking about um, using. I forget the character's name. The new Troop. one. No, the new one. Right. They're talking about using her like we used um, Throop. Oh, I thought it was like Throop will be useful to us as well. Like they hadn't had that meeting yet. Wow, oh. uh, interesting. But have to look back into that. While the majority of your work with Alien and Predator is well-loved, there is one series on your resume that isn't held in such high esteem. 
Uh, can you tell us about your experience writing Alien versus Predator versus Terminator? And were you aware of the reaction to the series? Um, no, I wasn't aware of any reaction to it, no. Um, but yeah, that's a one that's, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you take on jobs because you need the money. And it's a no, I, it's a no win to, to get three characters, all of which are beloved by different constituencies, and to try to give them e equal time and equal importance in the story is it's difficult. And uh, yeah, that's overall, there's, there's elements in that story that I am proud of and I liked, but overall it was, how do I fit all these puzzle parts together and make this work? And and I, and I don't believe the uh, the artist on this series. I I don't know how how engaged he was by the material. It's uh, it's a yeah. It it didn't work. The whole thing didn't work very well. I could see it being difficult when you're moving beyond just Alien and Predators and adding another versus in there. How it could easily kind of become a jumble. Uh, there were some other comics that that ended up being that way as well. There was one called Mine Hunter that was Alien, Predator, and then two Top Cow properties, Witchblade and Darkness, and it was just crazy, <laughs> just all over the place. Uh, you couldn't yeah. really follow the story on that one. So the, the artist of this particular story um, was also the artist of two of the Xenogenesis events that are credited for killing off the first Golden Age of Alien and Predator comics. Oh, and, and also the um, the Witchblade <laughs> series that Adam just Well, there were uh, two Witchblade series. The so first I wonder one. if he did the first Mind, one. Mindhunter. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it was sick of people giving him crap <laughs> for, for those series. <laughs> I, uh, it was, you know, to not it was a it was a an impossible assignment again you're you're trying to cram so many different elements into a limited amount of pages you know i forget if there was if it was a three or four issue let's say it was four issues 20 pages in each issue so 80 pages to try to make this all work just just it's just too much Out of interest, while you're talking about that, it was four issues, by the way. Okay. Why was Dark Horse doing four issues? The majority of their series is, were, yes, four issues. Why Why four? Do you know? Uh, I, I, I don't know, but I'm willing to bet it has to do with economics. Probably they saw diminishing returns after a certain number of issues of any series. It's like, why not just number, just do aliens and just consecutively number it and just, okay, maybe there's a four issue story and it ends at the end of the fourth issue. But then in issue five, we just start a new story that goes for however many issues. But I believe comic companies have come to realize that people buy lower number issues and they tend to tail off when it gets to higher. So they always want to go back to a number one, which brings in more, more buyers, more people buying because it's a number one. Well, we saw that with Marvel as well. Um, three, yeah. Was it three yeah. printings, Adam, mm -hmm. at least? Of the first one? Yeah. Yeah. Well, because it was a big yeah. new property for Marvel. I mean, I, I love Dark Horse, but Marvel has a much bigger market share. So I, I did hear it was a big launch for them. Even though, I mean, we we have issues with the comic, we're kind of hoping they find their footing with with that. But um, oh, okay. So are, are now are they tending to follow more alien or aliens, or what's their what's the basis of their universe that they're developing there? It's called Alien, um, unlike most of Dark Horses, which were aliens. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that, that, that's the first tonal sort of difference, but yeah, they did it, have an aliens one shot though. They did, yeah. Um, but it seems to straddle that line between the action horror, not quite going fully either either way. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but okay. they've they've only got the one ongoing <laughs> series at the minute, but they have been splitting it into arcs. Um, was it six? Was it six issues? I think it was six. Yeah. six or seven. I think it was yeah. six. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the the feeling in the comic world just seems to be that the more you can repeat a number one, an issue number one, that's why you see so many mini series, uh, just an ongoing series that gets into higher numbers. Right, makes and, sense. Uh, so you actually have the distinction of being one of only two writers to have written for Ripley 8 in the Expanded Universe. Um, for Alien vs. Predator vs. Terminator, though, uh, Ripley 8 seems to have taken a step backwards from the more hopeful ending that Resurrection had. Um, could you walk us through your sort of mentality of the creative decision that went into doing that to Ripley, you know, taking away that hope? Yeah, that's that seems unlike me because I <laughs> I like to have more hopeful characters, but I, I, I agree. I know she's in a dark place in the beginning. I, I'm trying to remember again what I was given beyond that I had to use the three different properties. But I think I was also asked to use Ripley post um Alien Four. Okay. And and to use uh oh what's her name? The uh Call. The synth. Call. Yeah. And and so I had to find a way of making them work. And I I do remember that I'd been very disappointed, very unhappy with the way, you know, I felt that the Ripley character should be handled in the uh the third and fourth movies. Uh I I, I thought, you know, they they put the poor woman who, you know, in the first movie is the level you know she deserves better i thought yeah. so i wanted to put her in a place where it kind of resolved her story and allowed her to be the you know she joins the predators and uh she becomes kind of the the she takes command of herself she takes she takes uh control of her life in that she's put in a position where she gets the chance to do that and it's it's a it's an end game. It's a suicide mission. But I like the idea that we were going back. I was reiterating the end of the first movie in the end of that series. Okay. That it was like she only she's the one in charge now. She's doing things in so, her terms. Right. So I did I did like now I'm thinking about it. I did like a lot about what because again I was so unhappy with what the movies had done. And again, my mind, you know, it's not my property, but in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I would have done things differently. So I got a chance to do that in this story. And uh, yeah, didn't quite work out, but that was that was my thinking. Well, see, I mean, it's an interesting way of taking it because, you know, Alien 3 is uh, about inevitability, I suppose. You know, she couldn't escape. And then you mm -hmm. have Resurrection where she's yeah. forcefully brought back to life. So even though yeah. even though it ended even though it ended on a positive, mm -hmm. well, a hopeful note, it's like your Ripley yeah. was suffering from those, you know, a trauma, I guess, from those two takes on her. I guess I I guess I didn't get the uh, quite the same feeling you got from the end of four. I I thought it was of resurrection. I I thought it was pretty. I didn't think it looked promising for her. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Given given what she's been through, see, I I always I always took the end of four as, I mean, a lot of the early parts of the film is is identity crisis. You know, is she alien? Is she human? Uh, straddling that mm -hmm. kind of thing, and the end of the film, you know, feels more like she's found her place. She's decided her place, and then the music, you know, towards the end as well as the descending and she's yeah. finally finally come home was where I always took that yeah. that that hopefulness from. Yeah, yeah, interesting. I, I I would have to see that again to figure out where my head was at at the end of that, mm -hmm. and and why I, I I took the direction I did in that uh, uh, Alien Predator Terminator series. I'm not sure, but I also liked her as a character, especially in regards to how she was handled in the first two movies. 
Uh, and, and maybe that's simplistic, having her as just more of a, a take charge. But I like the fact that she here she is just a, uh, what is her rank? She's the, uh, in, in the first film, she's the- uh, uh, She's a warrant, warrant officer. Yeah. Warrant officer, right. Yet she is the one that, uh, she handles things the best. She's just, uh, whatever it takes to, to rise to the crisis and, and overcome it. She's a survivor. Mm -hmm. And and I really didn't like that they they kind of reversed that in the third and fourth films. They made her a victim. And again, that's just that. my, my character. But but yeah. Everyone's that's got it, their I'm, own take. It's it's not it's not a take I hear very often, but that, you know, when you when you say it like that, yeah, I can yeah. I, I can yeah, understand. Kind of a case, yeah. Mm. Yeah. It, it is having her become the victor is more of a horror movie thing, right? It does give you more chance to to get into that aspect of things rather than you know someone who's who's conquering the the negative, whatever it is, the the the, the, the antagonist. Mm. But uh, yeah, I just like that character so much. I wanted better for her. So did you enjoy writing her then? Um, getting to play with her yeah, very much. Yeah, I had a lot of fun with her. And and no sort of was it was it like the other comics, you know, not much involvement from Fox in terms of what you were doing with her? Not that I can remember. I don't think so. Because there's any number of things in there you would think they would say, Whoa, we don't want that, you know. Mm. But we, nothing, nothing that I can recall. If it was anything, it was minor. So that's interesting because I mean when when you when you go to the predator side of what Dark Horse was doing Fox wouldn't let them use Dutch. They wouldn't let them use Arnie's character in case something came along with the films. And then, like mm -hmm. you were saying earlier, that you were then allowed to play with the space jockey and destroying angels, which was a change. And that kind of makes me think if it was more, if it was one of those situations as well, where they were keeping it in reserve in case the films came along. Right. And then when you have Ripley, it's like, nope, go ahead. You know, we're not we're not revisiting her. So yeah, that's, that's you know, interesting. That, that those kind of decisions also could be based on the the contractual agreements they have with the actors playing the roles. Arnold Schwarzenegger was a big name uh, when he made Predator, and he could have had contractually that they couldn't use his likeness mm -hmm. in another media without his permission or without some compensation. Uh, whereas Sigourney Weaver didn't have that kind of pull and power when she did Alien. And, you know, it could have been a whole different agreement. So it could be, yeah, you can use her likeness or her uh, the character and as much likeness as you want to use of her without without it being any kind of uh, a negative situation for the studio. I mean, that makes problem. sense, um, given his character finally did make a reappearance in a recent video game. And they, they talked about how they approached Arnold and they asked him about having his character in the game and what they wanted to do with his character. And, and he liked it and approved it. Whereas um, the last predator movie, the fourth predator movie also approached Arnold and wanted a cameo for his character, which he wasn't fond of the script. And so yeah, he didn't make sure. an appearance in that one. Yeah. And 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 the whole likeness thing was again a, a problem that Mark faced in the first three series as well, you know, and, and that affected the story yeah. that was being told there. Um, I have a friend who was a uh, an artist on the, uh, I believe it was Marvel was doing the Star Trek Next Generation series. This was probably back in the nineties, mm. uh, but it was hellish because all the major players in there. Uh, had the rights to approve their likeness in the comic. And so it was a mess getting everyone on board and agreeing, oh, yeah, I'll accept that that's, that's not going to hurt my image. I, um, I, I remember, um, oh, what I was, was going to bring this up for, oh, I forgot Troy's name. What's the actress's name? Who plays oh, Diana Troy? Sirtis. My, uh, Miriam Sirtis? Yes, or? yes. I remember seeing her talking about the first comics that they were seeing and um, how they were reacting to the likeness, actually, and, and the interpretation mm -hmm. there. That's actually interesting. Making me think about that one. Anyway, sorry, Adam, you were going to say? I was going to say there was supposed to be a 
uh, Alien versus uh, Star Trek The Next Generation comic. <laughs> yes. That was coming in 2017. <laughs> and the rumor was wow. Scott himself was responsible for getting it getting it canned. That's the rumor. But... Wow. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, how many uh, how many people outside the main cast do you want to kill off? I, you can't kill <laughs> off any of the main cast, so that kind of have all the takes all the... Star Trek has many ways around right. that, though. You yeah. know, many parallel universes and alternate timelines. It was fine. <laughs> you also wrote Superman and Batman versus Aliens and Predator. It was a bit of an event in that it was the last of the crossovers with Batman or Superman. And it also came during a time when Dark Horse had actually stopped publishing standalone series. Could you tell us a little about the development of that story and how you came to be involved? I think I was approached by the editor at DC, I think, about doing that. I think. Was that when you were that working on Superman? The... I'm sorry? Was that when you were working on Superman? No, I think I'd finished Superman by that time. Maybe not. Maybe I still was on Superman, but I'm trying to remember. But the, I believe the purview came under DC, the, the actual editorial control of that. I think. DC and Dark Horse, like one series they did together would be controlled by DC, one would be controlled by Dark Horse. You know, they alternated, I believe. But I believe the editorial, editorial uh, uh, control was through DC. And, and again, it was just one of those deals. I'd been, I had been writing Superman for enough years and the they needed someone who was familiar with aliens too and, and and predator so i was asked to uh was asked on board and uh good lord i'm, I'm blanking out on the um the artist's name but just beautiful artwork on it. gorgeous uh, I, I feel, uh, I was yes so, mm -hmm. uh, he he did um he did one olivetti. of the five Olive, mm -hmm. olivetti yeah yeah uh, and i believe he's south american i believe brazil or argentina and I hope I'm right, but yeah, just gorgeous work. Yeah, he came back for the AVP Leg of the Fire and Stone event. It's a very, no uh, very realistic kind of style to his artwork that I really like. I really, I really like um, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Batman no. and Superman versus Alien. <laughs> oh my god, they get so mouthy these crossovers. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I really like that run actually. I'm not a big fan of crossovers. Um, outside of Alien versus Predator, but that run I really like, and and, and I think his art as well uh, plays a really big part in that because it's very unique in terms of. The I visuals. think his art has a lot to do with it because again, it's one of those mashups that it's hard to it's it's impossible to satisfy all the constituents because there's just too much. There's just too many to try to cram in there. So, um, but but he. Uh, his artwork was stellar enough, was just gorgeous enough, I think, to cover up the flaws in my story, you know, and make it make it flow much nicer, much smoother. You so you you, you do two back to back crossovers. Is it do, do you find those the most challenging of what you've done from from the series? Um hmm. They're the most challenging in trying to get all the, the parts of the puzzle to fit together and work. But to be honest, they're, they're gimmick stories. And my, I don't sweat out getting things right as much as I would in like a Destroying Angels, which means more to me. Uh -huh. So in a way that's more challenging because I want to, get it right i want to i want to make that sing as well as possible that's not to say that i i blow off something like superman batman alien predator but it is what it is there's just not a chance to get into to really sink your teeth into either character development or or thematic underlying elements 
that you do in a story that is more focused on a much narrower, yeah. a much narrower scope. I do think you hit it with a uh, with the the big one though, because you had, I think it was about a hundred pages was that story, and okay, I think you hit it really well because there's a lot of Superman being Superman. You know, he feels throughout that book he feels flawlessly Superman, and Batman feels flawlessly Batman. Um. The only one, the only ones who ever feel like they suffer in these stories is the aliens, actually, which I think is a question for Adam shortly. Um, yeah. But before b- before I let him get there, though, actually, um, something I noticed in in um, Batman and Superman was a very cheeky reference to the aliens' homeworld being um, someplace in the neighborhood of Arcturus. Now, for alien fans, um, Arcturus is is very well known for um, the Octurian Poontang line from Aliens. Was that intentional? Was was that a callback to um, Aliens? I did not even recall that line. If I if I ever even really picked it up, you know, is that something that uh, Bill, uh, what's the name? Uh, not Bill Pullman. Bill Paxton. Uh, you thinking? Paxton. Um, did he, did yeah. he say that? Was that something he said? It, I, I'm fairly sure it was Rico Ross. Okay. No, it was no, it was both of them. It was both of them. There's an exchange. Um, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't recall that. I just liked the sound of Arcturus, and Arcturus was, you know, in mythology, star. Arcturus, Arcturus was, or Aris, I think the name was, was a hunter. So, right. oh, you know, just so the predators and yeah, okay, I get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair. This question spins off of one submitted by one of our community members, Sill who was asking specifically about Alien versus Predator versus Terminator. Um, But I wanted to broaden it to talk about crossovers overall. He feels like aliens tend to take a sideline in crossovers with other franchises. From your perspective as a writer and your time writing two crossovers, do you think that was the case? And why do you think that happened? Well, it's unfortunate, but it probably is the case because... The aliens really don't have any character development. The aliens are aliens. They're 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 ants. You know, they they do what they do. Whereas even the predator has a little bit of personality, uh, and it's easier to write and do more things with them. But the predators, you just have pretty much their biological process and mayhem. And You just, again, I guess you could write a story which is just, you know, 20 pages or whatever of alien, aliens overrunning and eating people and, and, uh, and procreating, but there's no story there. Whereas if you get involved, and, and that was a problem with the Terminators too. There, there's nothing to the Terminators. They're just destroying machines uh, until you get into, you know, the second Terminator movie and, and Schwarzenegger being turned. But but essentially the character that I had to work with, they're just machines. So you tend to invest more time in the characters that you can, you, they have some personality, you can do something with them. You can give them some sort of uh, problems, some sort of uh, situation they have to overcome. Uh, there's not much you can do with the alien as it is now. It's just a killing. It's just an animal that kills and reproduces. Now, having said that, having said that, again, I know a fraction of all the material that's been read about aliens. So someone else may have solved and gone beyond that. I don't know. Kind of makes me wonder if, from a writing perspective, they become more useful as tools or stepping stones. You know, like, like... the way mm-hmm. you interpreted the relationship in destroying angels, the way in Terminator it becomes a tool to create something with character as such. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. That that's uh-huh. their usefulness. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So 
something I'm curious, uh, keeping on that perspective as a writer, you know, something I'm curious about is series tropes. You know, established properties like Alien and Predator and Terminator and Batman and, and you know, everything, they have reoccurring tropes. So when you're working on a licensed property, you know, like this, as a writer, is your instinct to lean into that or is it to try and lean away from it? Hmm. That's a that's a really good question. It's uh, for me, it's a balancing act. There are tropes you've got to recognize and honor. But you don't want to end on them. You don't want to overutilize them. You don't want to repeat things verbatim. You know, you want to try to find a twist on it. Uh, so, yeah, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. And you also want to ideally add something, add a, add a, add a possible new trope in there too. Uh, something that might become a trope. Uh, but yeah, you, you've got to, you've got to hit certain storytelling mechanisms, elements that res resound with the, the readers or the, the viewer. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you gotta, you have to have both. Does it, does it make it difficult? Do you think that juggle? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Not as difficult as... <laughs> Not as difficult as digging ditches for a living, you know. It's, <laughs> it's 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 a good challenge. It's a good challenge, you know. It's a challenge, and sometimes you know you get creators block, and it's like, oh, why won't the answer come to me? Why can't I make this scene interesting? But most of the time, it's you know you figure it out and you move on. Okay. Most of what we've talked about today has been your writing work, but you're also an artist and did the covers for many of your series. Is there a particular cover that stands out as your favorite alien or predator work that you've done? Oh boy. Yikes. Hmm. Well, I was just looking at the, uh, uh, because I was refreshing my memory. I, re I really like the way this cover turned out. Do you, I don't know if your addition well, over there and, Great Britain used this artwork. This was the cover for the collection of Helen Hot Water. So I have a, Getting a um, it's a hardback um, recollection thing that they were doing, mm -hmm. which I think oh, yeah, is the was, cover that, that was UK only, I think. Which I think was, is that from the actual comic or is that one of your covers? I can't remember actually because it looks. Yeah, that was the cover to the first Dark Horse issue, uh, okay. the first comic issue in, in the States. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I like that one too. Personally, I've always really loved your cover of uh, the paperback of uh, Apocalypse. I just think this is such a cool pose for the alien and. Uh, you, you just do the alien really well. Like you, you give it a sense of movement, even in a static panel. Like it's one of the main problems we have with the new Marvel comics, honestly, is the, the, the artist can't really, can't really do aliens, but, but it's clear from, from your cover that you can. And uh, it, it is a really well, impressive thank piece. You. I like to instill that sense of movement. Yeah. Um, that, that was a cover I like cause I like the way the owl turned out in that one too, in the, uh, the cover that you put up. Yeah. And that's my that's my wife posing on the ground there, being uh, being crushed uh -huh. by the alien. Really? <laughs> it that's is cool. a very well known cover, and yeah, it, it is interesting with the owl attacking the alien there. Though no longer being published by Dark Horse, both Alien and Predator are under Marvel. Uh, would you have any interest in returning to write on a new series? Well, I don't know. At my age, probably not. It depends. It might. If it was the right artist and the situation, I would never say never, but it's unlikely. Hmm. Okay, well, that, that's actually all of our questions, Adam and I's, but uh, we do have um, a handful from our community members. We always like to give those guys a chance to ask any questions that we might have missed or they have specific ones that they want to ask, ask you sure. about. So for this first one, Amorton Jonesy would like to know if 
uh, Hannah Dundee from uh, Xenozoic Tales was an inspiration for um, through from Apocalypse. Uh, yeah, probably, because as we talked earlier, I like uh, female heroines, but I'll also say that <clears throat> that also goes back to uh, how uh, significant to Steve's character with the Ripley character. So, you know, there's lots of inspirations that go into Hannah. And uh, and yeah, yeah, that type of character absolutely influences the way I do other. Uh, I did Troop and uh, and other characters. Okay, cool. And Blue Marsalis seventy nine has some questions about destroying Angel's Owl, asking why was the owl not an android because of Blade Runner, and why have the owl at all? Oh, there's an owl in Blade Runner that's a replicant, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I when I saw that question, you had sent me that question, Aaron, and I couldn't quite understand what why. Uh, no, it's a real owl. I mean, why 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 have it as a synth? If <laughs> my, my thinking was that they they that the owl, the usefulness of the owls, its senses, it's it's able to sense things that humans can't see. It's a you know, it's it, it's opposed to having the uh, the Geiger meter device to try to find the alien, the clicking thing. You have an animal. You know, it's it, for me. I mean, I love these owls. I love. I had just read about these great growl, great gray owls, that literally they're huge. They have like six foot wingspans, and they they will come down on four feet of snow and stun prey that's on the ground four feet under. It just they can sense and they're effective that way. They're effective hunters. So I, I just wanted to get that in the story somehow. And I had a lot of fun with that. But uh, yeah, I didn't see any need I, to make it a synth. It's uh, to make it an android. I just wanted it to be a real owl. You know? So that, that was kind of like the scuba diving element of Helen yeah, Hotwater. Exactly. It, was, it was an interest at the time that you wanted to work in. Right. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff that goes into my stories just happened to be I saw the right article that on some something that inspired me, that got me excited, and it's like, okay. well, I gotta find a way to use this. <laughs> yeah, I, I can understand that. Uh, AVP Ryu has asked a question about the second Terminator hybrid in Aliens versus Predator versus the Terminator. Uh, Ryu notes he disappears after the big attack on the base and was wondering if he was killed outside of the panel or was he for a bait sequel? Oh my God. I don't have any idea. <laughs> I wonder if that was... No worries. If I wonder one... if I missed, I missed that. What did I do with the... Uh, yikes. What did I do with the Terminator? Yikes. I'm sorry. I don't know the answer to that. I would assume... No worries. I would like to. I would like to think that I was aware enough of the situation that he just got blowed up, and that was the end. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but a lot no, of chaos was, was going on. I, I can't claim that there was any uh, ulterior motive in mind to uh, have a second series with him. Okay. No. So, um, Phil Neris is also asking about um, Aliens versus Predator versus Terminator. And I think, yeah, do, do you like the way it keeps rolling, Adam? Is that, is that the, the chuckle? Um, and I think you you probably alluded to this earlier, really. Um, but he, he was curious as to why the conflict was in the future and it, and it wasn't set during the Skynet war. I believe, again, I believe it was... I had to integrate with the... Um, the world of post alien resurrection. And I had to make these timelines all, now it wasn't hard dealing with predators that that's, you know, that the timeline isn't all that consequential. They're just here all the time, more or less, but to make the timeline of alien, the alien universe that they wanted used to work with Terminator that had to have been the incentive. I'm, I'm guessing now because it's been that long, but that must have been the reason. Yeah, I thought it was with you also talking about it being, you know, an, an editorial for hire kind of piece. Right, so, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that was a that was a decision that was made 
above my pay grade, I'm sure. Okay. Well, th oh, that is everything. Um, before we let you get in that EVV and jet off, though, is there anything you'd like to say, you know, any anecdote or any thought that we haven't given you the opportunity to talk about with any of our questions? No, I think that covers it. I'm, uh, I'm surprised, but very happy that people enjoyed, uh, especially the Destroying Angels, which I think is the one thing I did in all these series that really worked well. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy that people still enjoy that. Um, and uh, so, did you did you not know how loved that was? No idea. I I I don't I don't follow um, a lot of social media or uh, online conversations and stuff. Uh, mostly because you don't want that stuff to get in your head when you're creating stuff. Uh, you know what I mean? You don't want to be influenced either by negative comments or by praise to, you know, well, I got to duplicate that again, you know, you, you, it's not a good idea to, so I stay away from, from online. So no, I, I had no idea. It's nice to hear. It's, it's really nice to hear. Gotcha. We, we really didn't talk about it much, but your AVP short story, um, Chain to Life and Death, I think I first read that there was a, a reprint of um, Annual that was with the AVP movie DVD that came with that, and, and your story was in that. And I thought it was a really cool short story, just to, like entirely from the Predator's perspective and his view on the alien and his final battle with one. Um, so I did really like that short quite a bit. Thanks. The, the artist on that, Tom Biondolillo, um, I kind of lost track of him, but he had been a student at a school, at an art school that I had uh, done some teaching at. And uh, uh, I think he's an art instructor now. But anyway, yeah, he did a great job on that. And I, I really liked it. That's an example of how you can make uh, the Predator, you know, bring a little bit of personality and a little bit of a little bit of inner inner conflict into that character, uh, which you totally you totally can't with the aliens. Because <laughs> yeah, he was recognizing himself in the alien, wasn't he? In that one, if I remember rightly. If I remember right, and I haven't re read it in a long time, but he was comparing himself, comparing the uh, yeah. you know, what that, he that, admired about the alien. That was a that was another good one where you would doing a different spin on mm -hmm. the typical as well. Yeah, I really enjoyed Chain to Life and Death. And I'm surprised I, I didn't put any questions in there actually about that one. But do cool. you have any, do you want to signpost people to your Facebook page or is there any website or anything like that that you would well, like people I, to check yeah. out? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a nice concise name for my Facebook page. It's just Mark Schultz's Xenozoic Tales and Other Stories on Facebook. So that is my sole social media presence. And I, I do post new art there and uh, information about appearances I'm going to be doing and stuff of that nature. Okay, cool. And uh, I'll make sure to include a link to that in the post that goes up along with uh, this podcast. And if you're watching this Thank on you. YouTube uh, rather than listening, um, I'll include a link in the description in the video below. And that was our interview with writer Mark Schultz, writer and artist Mark Schultz. Hope you all enjoyed that and hope you're enjoying your alien day. If you'd like to check out our website, it's avpgalaxy.net, where hopefully today we will be updating you on a bunch of news, we hope. Um, we're also on all the major socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. If you search AVP Galaxy or Alien vs. Predator Galaxy, you are sure to find us. And if you are watching this on YouTube, do please make sure you're liking and commenting and subscribing. It all helps the algorithms with making us more accessible to other fans that haven't discovered us yet. And also, please, you know, do share this podcast, do share this video uh, with an alien and predator friend. Again, all helps us and it's very much appreciated. Adam, before we go, though, quick bet. I am waging on a pair of shoes, a new, a new pair of bug stompers today. Well, How not, about you? That's not even something we have to guess on. They've already announced that, haven't they? <laughs> they I don't think so. 
Yeah, I thought there's a new one coming this year. The Bug Stompers. I don't remember. I'll have to have a look actually then. But yeah, hopefully, hopefully some good stuff. I'm not expecting much, but we'll see. But we're doing. We gotta do. Part. We gotta do like Alien Day Bingo or something. I don't know. Oh yes. Okay, I don't know if we'll have time to do that, but yes, for future that needs to be done. But uh, before we do, just sign off. I'd just like to thank Mark again. Um, he was very gracious enough to come on here and spend some time with us. And uh, from what I understand, he actually really enjoyed this one. So thank you again, Mark. Be sure to check him out on Facebook. The link is in the video description and in the podcast post. So uh, go give him some love. Thank you, everybody, for listening or watching. This has been Corporal Hicks. And Ridgetop. Signing off.